Okay, well, I assume that because he closed the door, it's a reasonable time to start. So, um, my name is uh, Jeff Silverman, if you have trouble reading the whiteboard. And uh, I uh, currently work for uh, Juniper Networks, and I am dedicated full time to supporting Microsoft and their uh, Azure network. And um, uh, there's a little bit of a difference between uh, Azure's network and your home uh, network. Microsoft claims that the Azure network is the largest one in the world. I think Google might argue with them, but uh, I'm not going to go there. Um, so uh, uh, this is the most important slide of the uh, whole presentation. Everything that I'm going to tell you is available on the internet if you know where to look and what to look for. But if you don't know what to look for, you won't know where to look for it. So the advantage of having a human being sitting at the front of the room is you can ask questions and um, the human being will tell you, ah, you need to know this. Go look here to go find it. So you have to ask questions. And that's how I'm going to know what it is you, you need to, to know. Does that make sense to anybody? Great. All right. So uh, I'm going to start off by having a discussion of the uh, seven layer uh, OSI protocol stack. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because every presentation on network begins with the OSI seven la layer stack. OSI is uh, the Open System uh, International, uh, and uh, that's French, which is why the adjectives are in funny order. Um, so uh, we start with the physical, I want this to be red. There. We start off with the physical layer at the very bottom, which is wires, fiber optic, radio, carrier pigeons, telegraph, whatever you uh, want. And the uh, unit is uh, things like electrons or photons or carrier pigeons. And these are an example of just some, but not all, but some of the standards that are out there for uh, carrying these things, the, the little ones and zeros from place to place. And then we go up a layer to the uh, data link layer. And there you're interested in access control. Uh, and the technical term for what's going back and forth is called a frame. Only hoity-toity network engineers and computer scientists actually use the word frame. Everybody else uses the word uh, packet. But since I'm doing an imitation of a hoity-toity computer scientist, I'm going to call it a frame. And the examples of that are Ethernet, which is the thing that you're most uh, likely to find. Um, FDDI and ATM um, are still things that you find from place to place. PPP is popular because a lot of the connections between your home router and your internet service provider look like PPP. And, and so if you see the acronym PPPOE, that is an Ethernet link masquerading as a PPP link. Don't ask me why, but that's the way they do it. Oh, here it is, PPPoE. There's Wi-Fi, which is uh, what's most commonly used, and, and there is uh, Bluetooth. So then uh, you get up to the network layer, and uh, this is come called the internet layer. That, that's what the IP means in uh, TCP IP. Uh, and that's moving data across networks. So when you have a network of um, like the internet, you have a whole bunch of little networks connected into one big network with uh, little black boxes called routers. And some little black bo uh, boxes weigh less than half a pound, and you put them in your house. And then Juniper makes a, a little black box called an MX960, which weighs about 500 pounds. And you have to use a special machine to go pick it up and put it in the rack. Uh, so in, and the kinds of protocols is IPv4 and IPv6. Um, there are some others that have gone into the trash bin of history, and we don't need to talk about them. So at the next layer is, is transport. And the idea there is reliable delivery of um, um, uh, packets. And the uh, encapsulation unit is a datagram, which is a hoity-toity word for a packet. Uh, and there's also streams. And there are three protocols. There are two protocols that are most popular. And there's another protocol that really ought to be, but isn't and never is going to be. So uh, TCP is transmission control protocol. And that's responsible for making sure that every 1 and 0 that goes in comes out in the same order. And then there's UDP, which all it does is guarantee that if you get a datagram, it will be right. 
but it doesn't guarantee that a datagram will be delivered. And then finally, there's SCTP, the Stream Control uh, Transport Protocol. And it's a wonderful idea, and it's never going to happen because uh, there's so much network hardware out there that only does TCP and UDP. And so if you were to implement an, an application using SCTP, there's a high probability that it wouldn't work simply because there's so much um, uh, old network uh, hardware out there. Um, so then in the OSI model, there's a layer called the session layer, and that's responsible for setting up sessions and tearing them down. And the unit of abstraction there is called a socket. And this is where the OSI layer and the TCP IP model uh, disagree because um, this functionality is actually here in the transport layer. So the next layer up is the presentation layer, which is responsible for things like uh, formatting and format conversion. And the uh, ones that you find most often here are uh, the secure uh, socket layer and the, um, oh, I forgot what TLS stands for. That's transport embarrassing. Layer security. Thank you, transport layer security. And it also does compression and character set translation. And finally, at the top, you've got applications, which are a veritable er um, um, alphabet soup of things. And the reason why the internet works as well as it does is because all the intelligence in the network is up here in the application. The only thing the network does is move ones and zeros back and forth. So if you come up with the bright idea that's going to change the world, it all goes up here, and you've got this whole infrastructure already built for you to deliver your wonderful idea to your customers wherever they may be in the planet. So, um, and that's the big advantage of the internet over um, um, the telephone company. So, uh, since this is a class on troubleshooting, I, I want to start off by talking about the troubleshooting strategy. So, first of all, take careful observations of what's working and what's not working. So, if all the clients are failing, check the server or the network. If most of the clients are working, <coughs> but some aren't, then check the client. If the problems are intermittent, which is the most difficult one of, of all, so check the infrastructure. Um, wires, radio frequency interference, um, <coughs> router issues, uh, distributed name server, these are all things that can contribute to intermittent problems. And they are a real pain to track down because if it suddenly starts working, you don't know, well, is it working because I did something, or is it working because it's intermittent? And uh, uh, my, my next recommendation is write down everything. And uh, I've got an example of this that I'm, I'm going to give later on. Um, and one of the reasons why you do this is because the stuff is so confusing that unless you write it down, you won't be able to keep track of what's what. Um, you want to remember what you did and what's left to do. Uh, if you make a change and decide that made things worse, uh, then you have a note of, of what it is you, you did. And um, one of the things that I uh, mention when I'm going to employment interviews is I have never come across a network problem that I could not make worse. And that's one of the reasons why I've been employed, unemployed for so long. Um, you uh, uh, will invariably call uh, customer support. And uh, my experience with customer support is that uh, they know less than you do. And the fact that you are here suggests that you still know more than they do. <laughs> um, and um, finally, if the problem comes up again, you'll know what you did to fix it the last time. Um, and Finally, my experience has been if you start at the bottom of the stack and work your way up, it, it works better. So um, uh, here is, I'm, I'm going back to the, the TCP model. Um, so um, this is an, an example of the kind of layers where, where things go wrong. Um, this is actually incomplete because Ethernet is also very popular. That's what I'm using at the moment, simply because I'm under enough stress as it is. Um, and uh, so here's an example of, of the kinds of tools that uh, you will be using. And um, I've tried to make this very simple and talk about just two different transport layers, Wi-Fi and Ethernet and Wi-Fi. And 
So uh, one of the things that's very popular is the IP command. I don't see people using it very often, and they really should, because IP config, which was the old way of doing things, is no longer maintained, but the IP uh, pro, uh, command is under active maintenance, and as new uh, network protocols and functions come out, it will be implemented in IP, and it probably won't be implemented in uh, 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 Netstat or uh, IP config. So next we go up to the network level, which is responsible for uh, transport. And um, the kinds of tools that I'm using there are things like ping and ping six. Um, if it's not in my local area network, but it's in the ISP's network, then I would use something like trace route or trace path. For uh, troubleshooting DNS problems, definitely use dig. Um, so then you go up to the transport layer, and uh, some of the problems that I typically find is that the server that I'm trying to connect to isn't listening. And so if the server isn't listening, you can fire as many packets at it as you want to, and nothing is going to happen. But until you use Net Nmap to see if the server is, is actually listening or not, you'll get these kind of weird errors that don't really tell you anything uh, useful. Um, NC, used to be called Netcat, is uh, another really wonderful tool, and I uh, frequently use it when I'm doing things, ah, uh, never mind. Uh, and MTR is uh, another program for uh, checking out uh, networks and looking for TCP connections and things like that. Finally, at the, the top layer, uh, there's curl, which should be done with a lowercase c, um, and that is a uh, command line based web browser. Wget is another command line um, web browser, but it has the advantage that it will automatically save any uh, file that you uh, get from the uh, internet. And uh, I'm told this really works well for pornography. I would know I don't do that kind of stuff. Um, Nmap is another uh, hacker tool that I, uh, never mind. Um, no, as, as a matter of fact, um, um, I uh, was applying for a job at a uh, computer dating service that was trying to become a telephone company. And um, uh, so I ran Nmap on their uh, website just as a means of getting ready for the uh, presentation. And I saw that they were running Linux, because Nmap will tell you that. And so um, uh, I, I went in there, and the HR person was talking to me ab about uh, Windows and Windows and Windows. And I said, you know, you're not running Windows. You're running Linux. No, we're not. We're running Windows. And so he drags me into the data center, and uh, he plugs in a monitor to a server. And there's the picture of the green hills with the blue, <laughs> which is called Bliss. And he said, see, they're running Windows. So I go up to the keyboard and hit the Enter key, and the screen disappears, and the username prompt appears in the upper left-hand corner. <laughs> and he says, what's that? So I, I tell him. So we go march into where the uh, technicians are sitting, and they said, why are you running Linux on the servers? And they said, well, the boss said we were having poor reliability, and he didn't care what it was they had to do, make it reliable. So they um, took all the windows out and put Linux on, and they didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and the reason why they didn't hire me is because I spilled the beans. Oh. Yeah, well, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Right. Um, TCP dump is a, uh, another uh, interesting little tool for uh, looking at networks. How many people know what a man in the middle attack is? Great. TCP dump is how you do that. Um, <laughs> There's also Wireshark, which is just like TCP dump, except it uses a graphical user interface. It's nice and colorful. Uh, and uh, so uh, um, if uh, some uh, joker comes along and says, what are you doing? And I say, oh, I'm doing abstract art. I'm not actually breaking into a network or anything like that. <laughs> OK, so um, here are two commands that are useful for any hardware problem. And the reason why I bring it up is because uh, a network device is an example of hardware. And uh, for all you know, something is going wrong with the device driver or the PCI uh, bus is, is doing something wonky. And uh, so you can use these two commands uh, to uh, go uh, troubleshoot what's going on in your uh, computer. So this is the physical level. This is electrons going back and forth. That's what's on the PCI bus. Oh, it's still working. Great. Um, 
So um, uh, next, here is the IP command. And uh, so uh, this interface is uh, broken. And the reason why it's broken is because it's got no carrier. The wire isn't plugged in. So then I plugged in the wire, and the interface still doesn't work. And you can't tell, but there is a uh, value here that's missing. It should say that it's down, but it doesn't. And in fact, I talked to the people that wrote IP, and they said, we can't fix it because there are people who parse this thing, and, and if we do that, it'll break it. But uh, put in a patch and make it a flag, make it optional, and we'll consider it. So uh, I'm going to dust off my copy of Kernigan and Ritchie and go write some software in C, which I haven't done in years. Um, so uh, um, by the way, uh, this presentation is uh, on um, uh, Google Docs, and I made it um, uh, public. And uh, a lot of the software that I'm going to talk about is on GitHub. And uh, there's lots of other stuff on GitHub. I'm kind of weird that way. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I'm looking at the uh, link, and I'm looking at the statistics on this particular link. And I discover, first of all, the link is up. And second of all, it's receiving bytes, which is good. And it's transmitting bytes, which is also good. And the problem is there are an um, extraordinary number of collisions. And I don't know why there are so many collisions on this network because there's just this laptop, my server in the basement, and a uh, Juniper MX210 switch. And so why are, where are all these uh, collisions coming from? I haven't a clue. But um, if this, was, this is already too high, uh, and uh, if I was uh, really concerned about it, I would go investigate it a little bit further. Um, but uh, I uh, was kind of in a hurry. So when I discovered this problem, I just filed it away for future reference and, and kept going. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, um, <coughs> the physical layer is uh, radio and Wi-Fi. And uh, some of the tools include Kismet and IWList. Uh, and uh, let's see. I'm, I'm always kind of reluctant to, to do this because uh, I'm afraid my connection to uh, Google is going to go away. But uh, we'll give it the old college try. So, I beg your pardon? <laughs> pray to the demo gods. Yeah, pray to the demo gods. Um, so, uh, there is a uh, XKCD uh, cartoon uh, that says, uh, make me a sandwich. And the yes. person says, no. And it says, pseudo make me a sandwich. OK. <laughs> Nobody look, I'm typing in my secret password. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I needed that. If you don't mind, I'll do the jokes. Um This, uh, wait a second, wait a second. I know what I'm doing wrong. Um, remember when I said um, write everything down? Well, uh, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. Um, see, it, it really is uh, helpful. Um, Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, this is uh, what you do if you want to find out what your neighbors are up to. Uh, <laughs> not that I would ever spy on my neighbors or anything like that, but they just happen to be uh, my uh, neighbors uh, <laughs> when I uh, ran this uh, command. So um, so this may take a moment given the the amount of traffic on the uh, network here. So these are all of the networks that um, can be seen from uh, this laptop at this particular moment. And uh, I like to show this off to my uh, Windows using friends, uh, how you can cascade things together to do things that uh, they, they wouldn't think about. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we, we can sort of do that. But uh, anyway, OK. Uh,
So um, the, ne the next up the list is uh, media access control. And again, I'm using the uh, IP command. And so this is telling me what all the neighbors are on my uh, network. So what it's doing is it's looking at the uh, ARP table. If you're familiar with the command ARP minus A minus N, this is basically doing the same thing, only it's more keystrokes. Don't ask me why it's better, but it is. Uh, and so this is telling me all the IP addresses, and this is telling me the, the MAC addresses and uh, the state of, of the uh, uh, link. And so, for example, this is a machine that uh, disappeared a, a long time ago, but uh, they say the network never forgets, and uh, this is an example of it. And these things that are stale are actually easy to fix. If you just ping uh, this uh, uh, IP address, this will become reachable. And so the reason why this one is reachable is this become, happens to be my uh, default gateway, but uh, we don't know that at, at the moment. Now, uh, how many of you know what IPv6 is? No, wait a second, I'm sorry. How many of you don't know what IPv6 <laughs> is? Okay, well, one of the major uh -oh, problems that is facing the internet is we're running out of IP addresses. When the people invented IP back in the early 1980s, it never occurred to them that somebody would invent a computer that would be the size of the head of a pin. And it needs an IP address. So they thought that 4.3 billion IP addresses was going to be enough. And it was for decades, but that was decades ago. And now we've run out of IPv4 addresses. And so the um, Internet Engineering Task Force invented something new called IP version 6. And um, they invented it in the late 1990s, and here it is, 2017, and there's still people running around who don't know what it is, and some of them work for ISPs. Uh, so um, <laughs> this particular uh, command shows me two IP addresses. This one that begins with FE80 is called a link local IPv6 address, and this is for use for this computer to talk to mm -hmm. other machines on this particular local area network. It's called a unique local address, or ULA. Now, this address down here that begins with 2601, this is a unique global unicast address. So this is the address of my computer, and it is unique across the entire planet. All right, so I don't use, need to use RFC 1918 uh, IP address translation. Um, I can use my uh, global address, and that means that uh, any evildoer in Russia can come into my computer if, if they want to, and I haven't stopped them, but I've stopped them. Um, so uh, um, by the way, um, in general, if you see something that begins with 192.168, that is a private IP address, and if you have an address like that, then it's very, very difficult for a bad guy to get into your uh, uh, computer. It's not impossible, but you have to be kind of stupid in order to let that, or very smart, and uh, to uh, let that happen. So this, uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that, that you want to look for. Uh, addresses that begin with 10 are also in the same class, and addresses that begin with 172 from 12 to 16 are also uh, those kinds of private addresses. Um, so, um, I uh, um, did some uh, uh, hacking, no I didn't, uh, with um, TCP dump and I uh, saved the files. Um, oh, whoops, I understand. Um, There's always one joker who asks me that question. Yep. <laughs> the, the answer is that somebody came up with a really bright idea and decided that it had to be done at the transport layer. So he managed to get an RFC published that said the number five is reserved for this application. The application, dumb idea. <laughs> but five had been allocated for all time, so they had to go to six. True story. Wow. I, I am not making that up. Well, yeah, but some of it's more useful than others. OK. <laughs> so uh, I, 
I beg your pardon? Why did they start at 9 p.m. Eastern? They didn't, as a matter of fact. They started at 1. Yep. There's 1, 2, and 3. And all those things are really, really ancient and didn't work very well. And based on the experience of what didn't work with 1, 2, and 3, they came up with 4. And 4 worked well enough until the late 1990s. Yeah, so uh, I just switched from Comcast, who I loathe, to CenturyLink, who I merely hate. And um, I discovered that their IP. I, I rehearsed this last night, really, I did. Okay, so this is what IPv6 uh, startup looks like. So uh, I, I believe it or not, it is easier to work with IPv6 than it is with IPv4, even though you're dealing with 128-bit addresses instead of 32-bit addresses. So when the router starts up, it sends a message out the uh, link local um, uh, network that says, I am a router. And uh, so you can tell because the uh, destination address begins with FF, that, uh, I'm sorry, FF02, and that tells you, tells the network that this is a uh, broadcast message that's going to everybody that says, I am the router. And all the machines that are running IPv6 get this message and they say, oh, he's a router. So if I have any packet that wants to go someplace that's off this network, send it to it. So, and then, um, it's going through a neighbor discovery protocol where it is looking for uh, various machines that have this IPv6 address. So uh, how many of you have configured a network where you had two machines with the same IPv4 address? Yep. Okay, wasn't pretty, was it? Nope. No, it wasn't. So um, with IPv6, whenever a machine comes up on the network, it sends out, goes through neighbor discovery protocol, and it sends out a message that says, I want to use this address. Is anybody else using it? And if nobody is using it, then it says, great, I'm going to use this address. You cannot have address conflicts in IPv6 unless you really work at it. Um, so uh, here is another router uh, solicitation. And um, here is a, a neighbor advertisement. Uh, and um, I forget what SOL stands for, but it's really a good thing to see. And um, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 we're, we're laughing at what it could stand for. Right. Yeah. Oh, what could it stand for? I love that. Right. Thank you. So, uh, and, um, so this address. Um, you'll notice has got uh, colon colon three in it. The colon colon is a um, um, idiom for a whole string of zeros. So uh, this is an address that uh, I put in by hand. And the reason why you can tell that I put it in by hand is because it's got the colon colon and then a small integer. So um, if this doesn't work, I know it's my own fault. And uh, accountability is, is really useful. Uh, because even though I have little authority, I have great responsibility. Um, so uh, uh, here it continues to do router advertisements and more address solicitations. And this is from number two. So this is another machine that's in the process of coming up. And it's trying to see if uh, anybody is uh, using it. So uh, and here's yet another machine coming up. And uh, uh, it wants to use its uh, IPv6 address. And so that is uh, how a router starts out on a uh, network. And it is incredibly simple and very reliable. And I just love it. And uh, aside from the teeny weeny little problem that nobody on the planet uses it, uh, IPv6 is the way to go. I, I use it. Beg your pardon? I use it. Are you on this planet? Yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes two of us. Yeah, there you go. No, as a matter of fact, Google is, is keeping track of IPv6 usage, and the last time I looked, they were up to 4%. Yep. And, uh, I can tell you, Jeff, that because I use IP6, I didn't know that a switch had failed in my network. Oh, really? Because my router advertisements for IP6 and my DNS 
SSRD, my RD and SSD. So my IP6, basically DNS information, was getting published from the router. Uh -huh. It was on the other side of the failed switch, the same side as the WAP, so my wireless devices were able to get out to the internet over IP6. The sites I was hitting were IP6. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that the switch was dead until I tried to sign in on the Xbox, which wanted, must have wanted to use IP4. Mm -hmm. Ooh, didn't work because it couldn't talk to my DNS server. Didn't have an address yet. Y it you know, I, I'm going to have to put that into my troubleshooting slide. If uh, IPv6 works and IPv4 doesn't, look at uh, a switch. That's and, good. And it depends on how your infrastructure is laid out. If my resolver for IPv6 was on the other side, it mm -hmm. didn't work. But Slack was coming from the router, so that's what I'm using, Slack. Right. And so IPv6 was like, hey, this is great. We're mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. And the other machine hadn't had an address yet. Couldn't talk to the DHCP server on the other side of the code station. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. A potential solution could be using a IPv4 to 6 tunnel. Correct. 6 to 4. Well, that's what I have to use because, like Jeff was saying, some of these cable providers don't even know what IPv6 yeah. is. So, yeah. oh. hello, oh. Hurricane oh. Electric, which introduces that other problem of now you can't watch Netflix. Yes. Yeah. 200 phone calls later to your ISP. Come on, IPv6. No, right. <laughs> one GitHub package later. And yeah. You don't care. <laughs> yeah. Now, now at, at, at Comcast, there's a guy named Larry, and he's down in the basement, and it's gotten to the point where uh, when I had a problem with Comcast, I would call him up, and I said, I've got a problem, and it's with Linux, so just transfer me down to Larry in the basement. <laughs> and uh, Larry and I are on a first-name basis. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Larry. What's new? Have you seen this really cool command? No, I haven't. Have you seen this really, you know, it's really great. <laughs> But he's down in the basement where no one knows that he exists. Poor guy. So uh, anyway, um, I want to talk about routing. So um, with um, uh, routing, I want to test to see if, if uh, Google is working. And one of the reasons why I pick Google is because they've got lots of points of presence all over the internet. Google is really interested in making things fast. So they've got POPs, points of presence all over the internet, and they've got their own network and it's just magic how it gets from the pop to their data center nobody knows but it just <laughs> works so I know that if Google is working then my network is working and I know if Google is not working it's my problem somewhere uh, so uh, this is um, uh, my pinging um, uh, uh, Google and I can see that the uh, round trip time is uh, 40.7 milliseconds which is not bad uh, and uh, I'm getting 100% uh, uh, reception, so life is good. Now, uh, actually, I uh, spoke about this a moment earlier, so unless someone has a um, uh, fetish about large integers, I'm going to skip it, um, and I'm going to go on to uh, IPv6 routing. And again, I'm talking to Google because I know they are fully IPv6 compliant, and uh, so again, I see 0% packet loss, so again, life is good. So you were talking about um, testing using IPv4 and IPv6. I haven't completely not thought of that, but uh, uh, it's still a good um, comment to make, and I'm glad you did that. Okay. Now, um, back to the IP command. Assuming that you've got a problem with routing, if, if ping is, is not working, then I can take a look at the uh, uh, routes. So uh, in this particular case, uh, I've got a uh, router with a um, uh, global IPv6 address, and this is actually a network mask, so uh, that's what the slash 64 means. So you take the first 64 uh, bits of the address, and that tells you what network it is, and the last 64 bits is telling you which computer is on your uh, network. And uh, if someone has a pocket calculator, they can figure out what 2 to the 64th is. You can have a lot of devices on your uh, network. Um, so, uh, uh, and here it is for uh, IPv4, and uh, it's the same, only different. So instead, it uses the word default, which means everything, and 192.168.1.1 is the address for my router, uh, and it's going through the um, uh, wireless. So, uh, and uh, this tells me uh, how the packets are getting from uh, my network to the uh, outside world. And this address comes from a protocol called uh, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, DHCP, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So um, I've kind of uh, gone through neighbor discovery protocol when I did that uh, Wireshark capture, so I'm going to skip over that. 
Um, here is the dynamic host configuration protocol. And um, normally, when your system starts, uh, this um, just works. But if you're having problems, then what you can do is you can stop the DH client and restart it. So DH client is the program. I'm working with IPv4. Minus R means um, uh, erase all of the uh, lease files. And that's what tells the machine what IPv4 address to use when it starts up if the DHCP daemon gives it permission to, to do it. So in this case, I'm wiping out its memory so it can start from scratch. And then uh, I run DH client again. Again, it's IPv4. Minus D means run in daemon mode, and minus V means verbose. Uh, so this tells me what uh, network it's uh, listening on. In this case, it's my Ethernet. And it does a discover. Uh, and then it does a request. This address came from uh, uh, its memory. And uh, so then it does an offer and an acknowledge. And uh, so then here it's, it's bound. Uh, so it's going to use this uh, IPv4 address, and it's going to keep it for a little bit less than uh, 10 hours, uh, 8 hours. I can't do the arithmetic in my head anymore. So uh, this is the kind of thing you use to see if your DHCP uh, daemon is working properly. Um, now the next thing that typically goes wrong is um, uh, name service. And uh, a lot of people don't know about IP addresses, but they know about names. So name service is the uh, component that uh, translates names into IP addresses. So for example, if you want to go to the uh, United States Postal Service, this ups.gov is their domain. And uh, this is their IPv4 address. Now, as it turns out, there is an issue with the usps.gov. And that's that if you don't have the www in front of it, it doesn't work. So I sent off an email message to the uh, chief information officer of the USPS, and I told her about the problem. And her response was, who are you and what are you doing to our networks? <laughs> what? What? Yeah. So um, this yeah, IPv6 is even more confusing. So uh, if you look up um, Google, this is its IPv6 address for my particular um, uh, uh, pop. So here is the dig command. This will tell you what the IPv4 address is by default. And if you want to look at the IPv6 uh, address, then you have to use minus T A A A A. And why it is A A A A is kind of a long and horrific story, which I won't go into, but there's a good reason for it. Um, there's some other values for T. Uh, MX is how you find the uh, mail server for this domain. C name is if, if this name is actually an alias for some other name. And uh, PTR is used for reverse address lookups. And there are a couple of dozen other things that uh, you can put in a, in a DNS database. If, if you have your own name server, there's all kinds of wonderful hacky things that you can do sending out hard to find messages. And if you're lazy like me, I think you can emit the dash T because I've never seen that before. I always yep. just dig quad A. Yep. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. That's good to know. Um, now, if your local name server isn't working, and I don't know why your ISP's name server would stop working. <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, <Podcast>. you you <laughs> right. So um, uh, you can use the uh, at um, character into the dig command, and you can use somebody else's name server. And I happen to like 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 because I can remember it. It's Google's name server. Uh, this website, public-dns.info, has got a list of uh, public name servers all over the world. And uh, one switch to the dig command that I use sometimes is the uh, plus short switch, which gives you just the answer and not the, the steps that you use to get to the answer. Uh, when you were in elementary school, your teacher said, show your work. And uh, DNS takes that philosophy to heart. And sometimes you don't care how it did the work. You just want the answer. Um, the uh, last couple of times I, I gave this talk, somebody in every talk said, can I make Wi-Fi go faster by boosting the transmitter power? And the answer is no, you can't. And the reason why is because 
In addition to boosting the um, uh, transmitting power, you also have to boost the uh, receiver sensitivity. And when you boost the receiver sensitivity, then more access points from around you start polluting your section of the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, you're, you're fighting a, a losing battle. And uh, the secret is to go get uh, bandwidth at higher and higher frequencies. Uh, and uh, there's something called the Nyquist theorem that you can Google if you want to. I'm not going to go into it. Um, now, what you can do is you can use a more directional antenna. And uh, in fact, there were some hackers, uh, I'm sorry, some uh, electrical engineers who uh, had a Wi-Fi network that went from one side of Elliott Bay to the other. And what they used were some extremely directional antennas and they were able to get the Wi-Fi signal from one side of the bay to the other. But um, normal people wouldn't do that. They did something similar in Las Vegas at DEF CON with a challenge from one side of the desert to the yep. other. They did they do it? Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. And they got dinged from work. Great <laughs> <laughs> presentation. Uh -huh. And there's legal limits on transmit power. You've got Correct. to remember that. that no, as, as a matter of fact, the FCC was just wiped out by executive order. <laughs> okay, now, um, one, one of the uh, uh, conversations that I had with my wife, who is an artist, is, uh, dear, why, why does the network go down from time to time? And that's actually a damn good question because when the internet was designed, it was originally designed by the Department of Defense, and they wanted a network that would withstand a nuclear attack. Uh, and so here it is uh, 50 years later, and the internet still won't withstand a nuclear attack. But um, what uh, happens, and this is under the hood, is your ISP and other ISPs and higher level network providers are working together to do something called dynamic routing. So uh, if uh, some idiot with a bulldozer digs up a fiber optic cable, the network will detect that problem and work around it. And um, so I'm working for uh, Juniper, and uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is a system called RSVP, which will detect a problem with a broken link and work around it in 50 milliseconds. And uh, I think that's very cool because with TCP, you have three seconds for a packet to get from one end to the other before it considers it a drop packet. So if you have the idiot with the bulldozer, TCP will recognize it for one packet, and then it will keep going. Um, so, um, uh, but some of the problems that we have is, is some of the ISPs do things a little bit differently, and uh, that sometimes causes issues. Uh, sometimes new software comes out, and, uh, well, let's, let's not go there. Um, for uh, the networks that are using uh, border gateway protocol or open shortest path first, um, it takes a while for the um, uh, broken link problem to converge to a solution, and that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about RSVPs. Um, the routing tables for IPv4 are absolutely enormous to the point where uh, last summer uh, some of the uh, older routers in the network ran out of space in their routing tables and the internet bifurcated. It was, there were one section of the internet and another section of the internet that couldn't reach each other. But unless you were monitoring that sort of thing, you, you wouldn't notice. But it was kind of a, boy, we, we gotta do something about this kind of issue. So uh, finally, IPv6 is going to solve a lot of these problems. If you're an IPv6 router, life is wonderful except for the fact that utilization of IPv6 is up to only 4%. So, uh, um, but anyway, what you can do is you can use TracePath or TracePath 6 to go from your machine to your favorite uh, server and uh, keep track of that kind of thing. And when something breaks, you can call up your ISP and say, oh, your uh, router in San Jose is broken. And they're going to go, huh? What? Yeah, okay. exactly. You had a question in the back? It is, uh, they're, they're counting IPv6 packets and IPv4 packets and calculating the ratio between. Packets, not, not directly through a website. No, packets. Um, 
IP does not guarantee delivery. Never did, never will. Deal with it. Um, one of the problems with lost IP packets is that it means that things slow down, but in general, things don't stop because that's what TCP was designed to uh, prevent. So TCP, reliable stream delivery, if a packet is lost, TCP will detect it, send a retry message back to the sender, and the sender resends the packet. So it takes time, but it still works. So it is, as we would say, failure tolerant. And that's the best you, you can do. So there's a utility called MTR. And if we have enough time, I will uh, demonstrate it. Um, uh, you were mentioning network security. I'm actually not really going to say much about network security because there's really, it's kind of out of the scope of this discussion. There's nothing here you haven't seen before. It's, this is a really interesting topic. Uh, no, 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 you, you guys aren't interested in this sort of thing. Except don't use WEP or WPA. Use WPA2. Um, if your uh, setup does not use WPA2, go home. Don't, don't, don't do it, really. That's all I'm going to say about security. Uh, if anybody wants to take a picture of the slide, is everybody who wants to take a picture of the slide taking Because I'm not going to say anything about security. OK, so. Um, some conclusions. First of all, keep notes. When something doesn't work, go write it down. That's what copy and paste is for. Um, make careful observations not only of what's broken, but what's working. So if my wife's iPhone doesn't work and my Android phone does work, the problem is in the iPhone. Don't go looking in the router, because the router is fine, dear. Um, <laughs> well, she's an artist, okay? So uh, her, her comment was, well, gee, Jeff, if you've seen one one, haven't you seen them all? And aren't the zeros really nothing to look at? Um, and anyway, um, so if nothing is, work, is working, then start thinking about what things are uh, common. And this is why it's really good to have a couple of hundred IoT things in your uh, house so that you can get lots of debugging experience about what works and what doesn't. Um, beg your pardon? Mm. Yeah, uh -huh, that, that's fine. So, uh, and uh, start at the bottom of the uh, protocol stack and, and work your way up. Uh, check both uh, protocols, IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, see if you can ping the, the gateway, the default router, and then see if you can ping the, the destination. If you can't ping the gateway, the remote destination isn't going to work. Um, trace, damn it. <laughs> What's that, man? Well, the D in trace path doesn't belong there. But, uh, and the capital T should be lowercase. And both of them should be in courier new instead of REL. So uh, anyway. Uh, and my laptop battery is running low. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, look, at, look at both TCP and UDP and uh, look at DNS. And um, finally, your network is going to break. Really, it is going to break. Um, and all you can do is be prepared for it. So uh, record which device has got which MAC addresses. Um, Record the IPv6 and IPv4 addresses because they really don't change that often. Um, record the uh, routing tables. Um, be sure to look at what name servers your machines are uh, looking at. Uh, and have some trace paths to uh, servers that you uh, constantly uh, patronize. Um, and I've got some tools that I'm writing that, that uh, does this. And uh, of course, software is always late and over budget, and mine is no exception. But uh, I'm writing a cool tool called the um, uh, Network um, Boot Monitor and uh, Describe and Test uh, Program, uh, which I hope to have finished by a month ago. And um, then there's a program that I wrote uh, last week that uh, uses the IP command to go test how well uh, your link is working. And what it does is it uses a variant of the IP command that outputs all of the numbers on a single line. So this program 
runs the IP command, captures the output, waits a few seconds, runs the IP command again, and uh, captures the outputs and uh, to see it if the uh, link numbers have uh, changed. And if they have, you know your link is working at least reasonably well, and if they haven't, then you know that you've got a link issue. Okay, and um, finally, on a piece of paper where you keep someplace safe and secure, your IP name, account number, the help desk phone number, uh, and also your router password. And I'm not making this up because when something goes wrong, you'll want to log into your router. And if you don't know what the router password is, you're not going to be able to do that. It should be in your password safe. It should be in your password safe. But invariably, uh, if the router goes down and I'm out traveling, I can't get through the router to get to the password safe. Oh. <clears throat> the other, another presentation at this same time. Time slot. Beg your pardon? There was another presentation at the same time slot talking about using git annex and keypass x so that you can get to your password safe behind you. Oh, hey, that's great. You can <laughs> catch the review. Okay. Replay later. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I've come to the end of my slide deck, and um, so uh, do people have questions? Yes. What's the difference, if any, between trace path and trace route? Trace route uses. Um, the same protocol that ping does. And the problem is, is that ping has been associated with something called the packet of death. So a lot of people firewall it. Uh, so it's not as useful a, a troubleshooting tool as it used to be. By way of contrast, uh, Traceroute uses UDP to a uh, strange port that nobody ever uses for anything. And because it's UDP, um, system administrators and network administrators are um, less likely to go firewall it. So it's actually more useful. That's a good question. Yes? I've been told by my supervisor to not trust IPv6 and to disable it on all of our computers. And for the example, like the gentleman in the front row, your computer was able to circumvent the router, which is, which is where most firewalls are built, into and go directly to the website. I didn't circumvent the router. The router was what was passing out the IP6 addresses. So, so so my DHCP server was on a broken. Right? No, it's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. It's good. Okay. Fact, it, what, what, what amused me was is I was actually listening to music on my Sirius <laughs> on my phone while I was mowing the lawn on the Wi-Fi. I had no idea IP4 was down until I finished mowing. It was like, hey, all right, finally get to play some Xbox for the first mm -hmm. time this week. This is mm -hmm. great. What do you mean I can't sign into Xbox Live? And <laughs> your, does, does your phone have the proper security my, feature my, built in? Well, it's an Android, and it's got IPv6, and it's, it's rooted, so I've got firewall on it. And actually, there's firewall sitting at the router that's passing out the IPv6 addresses. So unsolicited IP6 traffic isn't allowed to enter my network at the border. Okay. Okay. It's stateful, so it sees. You send IP6 packets out. Oh, these are responding packets. Let them back in. Okay. Okay. So is that, an, is that an argument that I can use with my supervisor then? Like, like that we should trust it or should we not trust it? Like, Actually, I've... Go take the Hurricane Electric IP6 class. <laughs> it's free. Okay. You can get certification. You'll learn all kinds of cool things yep. that will get you started and get your brain rolling on. To, oh, I want to know more about this. Like things that Jeff was showing us. Hey, if this is an FF02... You know, it's a router announcement. Yep. And some of these special prefixes and things like the uh, ULAs, unique local addresses, you'll learn about all that kind of stuff in that class. And what you don't learn, you'll get pointed enough down the road to figure out yourself. But then you'll be able to say, hey, look, I'm an IP6 sage, and I got all this knowledge to tell you about what we can do with IP6 and how to keep ourselves safe with it. I've, I've got a better solution than that. And this is something that you should do anyway. Um, don't think the way your boss thinks. Think the. <laughs> think think the way the bad guys think. Yep. Yeah. Because the bad guys yeah. don't have laptops whose batteries just died. Um, but there is a command called nmap. Yep. And, uh,